Experiences are what people love the most about travel. Viator is a website and app where you can book travel experiences like hiking Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania or enjoying the views while cruising on a catamaran in the Caribbean. They offer everything from simple tours to extreme adventures. With over 300,000 bookable experiences in 190 countries, there's something for everyone. Plus, Viator's travel experiences have millions of real traveler reviews, so you have the information you need to book the best activities for your trip. When you book a travel experience with Viator, there's always flexibility and support with free cancellation, payment options, and 24-7 service. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10. That's V-I-A-T-O-R-10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. One app, over 300,000 travel experiences you'll remember. Do more with Viator. Prepararse para lo próximo que viene es una parte importante en el proceso de hacerse un adulto. De modo que si su hijo le dice que quiere unirse a las Fuerzas Armadas, se está preparando para un reto. Visite todaysmilitary.com porque su éxito del mañana empieza con su apoyo hoy. Hello, thanks for joining us. My name is Andrew Dunkley, uh, the host of Space Nuts. It's great to have your company. And we've got a lot to talk about. In fact, um, the audience is going to do the talking because we're dedicating the whole show to questions. So we've got questions about Artemis I, uh, dark matter, flickering stars, space time, black holes, uh, gravity, and terraforming Venus, uh, which will be interesting because... <laughs> It's a hotbed, that place, a very, very uh, nasty place if you set foot on it, which I don't advise. That's all to come on this edition of Space Now. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining me, as always, is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Good day, Andrew. How are you doing? I am quite well, thank you, sir. <laughs> and uh, you're looking fine? Yeah, I feel all right. Thank you. All good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. All right. Well, um, we might as well just cut to the chase and start uh, <laughs> answering some of these questions because uh, I, I love question episodes. Me too. And I know we usually do every fifth, but we've been mixing it up. Oh, boy, haven't we? So <laughs> we're not waiting till next week. We're doing it today. Uh, just a pair of rappers we are. We're doing yeah, anything. We yeah, we are. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, just, we just, you know, we're not going to conform anymore. Quite Question right. episode a week early. <laughs> All right, uh, let's, let's get stuck into it. Uh, this is a, a, an ongoing story uh, concerning a certain rocket that is still on the ground when it shouldn't be known as Artemis One. Uh, Ryan has a question. Hey, Fred and Andrew. This is Ryan from Townsend, Delaware in the United States. I have a question about the Space Launch System, the SLS. The main tank uh, is coated in that orange foam, much like the Space Shuttle's main tank was. The primary reason for the main tank being coated in foam for the Space Shuttle was to prevent the buildup of ice on the outside of it that during launch could break free and damage the fragile uh, heat tiles underneath the space shuttle. But the SLS has no space shuttle hanging off its back. So ice breaking free from it should pose little to no danger. I'm just curious if you happen to know why the SLS is coated in painted orange like that with that protective foam. Thanks for everything you guys do. Love the podcast and Kate went, can't wait to hear the answer. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I think I know the answer to this one, sort of. But, uh, yeah, um, safety is obviously a major consideration regardless, even even with a rocket launch that's not going to have anyone on it because in the future Artemis will have people on board. So um, maybe we backtrack and talk about that particular tank that he's referring to. Yeah, that's right. So... Andrew, that was uh, the. It's the essentially the same tank that was used uh, exactly as Ryan says for the space shuttle. Uh, the space shuttle had it attached to the side uh, with the booster rockets, uh, and uh, the space shuttle's three engines uh, did actually think only um, something like 
20 less than 20 percent of the work of getting getting the uh, spacecraft into uh, certainly a, a, to high altitude because uh, the space shuttle had two firework night boosters attached to it yeah. solid fuel boosters um, which are also used in the space launch system so there's a lot of technology that has been transferred from one to the other mm-hmm. uh, and I think that the, the fuel tank um, itself which actually basically makes up the main body of the uh, of the SLS rocket it won't be exactly the same because it's got got to take stresses that the fuel tank didn't have to take uh, but um, a, a lot of design principles have been incorporated including that insulating foam um, with good reason I think because uh, you know the prevention of ice buildup is really important when you've got anything uh, attached to the to the rocket and in this case, you've got the two solid fuel boosters strapped to one on either side of it. So if you had a lump of ice uh, that uh, clobbered one of these uh, in a critical position, uh, now it's not anywhere near as fragile as the wing of the space shuttle. And of course, that's what brought uh, the Columbia spacecraft uh, down um, yeah. when it tried to re-enter uh, because of a penetration of the wing by a chunk of ice. So the, the solid fuel boosters aren't that fragile. But uh, the last thing you want anything uh, you know, being hit by is a solid lump of ice. And I think that's the bottom line. That is why... We still see uh, the orange. Uh, it's not the most beautiful color. Um, I heard a, another description for the color. I forgot what it was. It wasn't magnolia, but it was something like that. A very fancy. baby something. The, um, mandarin or so. It was. <laughs> yeah, it was. No, it wasn't a baby one. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it was something much more floral. Uh, and uh, it's a yes. It's a nice description, but of course, it's orange, really. So. Yeah, I, I do recall with the very first official space shuttle mission they they did paint it white for the occasion so the first launch uh was the whole thing was white the shuttle was white the solid rocket boosters were white and the sls was white Uh, but they only did it once because it was expensive and they you know wanted to show the thing off but subsequent missions it was it was that um san francisco bridge color (laughs) yeah (coughs) and and, and here sidebar do you know why the San Francisco Bridge, the the Golden Gate Bridge, is that colour? It's the nearest that could get to golden, probably. <laughs> no, nothing to do with it. Nothing to do no, with it. Sure the guy who not. built the bridge loved the colour. Oh, really? That's all there is to it. Yeah. He just loved the colour. Colours are uh, <clears throat> really interesting in their historical uh, context. And um, I'm going to throw one in as well. That has no relation to any of what we've been talking about, except it's about colour. And that is the Anglo-Australian telescope, the largest optical telescope in Australia, which is not far from where you're sitting now, yeah. about 150 yeah. kilometres as the crow flies. Um, it, it's colour. You might remember because you've, you've been there and you've seen it. The, 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 tube of the, the tube structure of the telescope, which is not a tube, it's, it's like an open, you know, an open uh, a, 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 lattice framework <clears throat> excuse me that's white uh, that bit of it is the moving bit but the mounting itself the bit that steers the telescope around yeah. uh, half of it is a sort of avocado or mustardy color and the other half is either gravy or chocolate depending on which you like best but those oh. colors were chosen by the wife of the commissioning astronomer uh, ben Gascoigne was the commissioning astronomer, the senior commissioning astronomer. His wife was Rosalie Gascoigne, who was one of Australia's most noted artists. Um, during the 1980s and 90s, she produced a huge body of work based on mostly found objects, things you know, um, things like road signs all keyed together uh, oh, to wow. make. The, and her work hangs in many, many significant galaxies. Sorry, not galaxies, probably galaxies as well. Galleries. It's in one. It's yeah, one. it's in, in one. one. Yeah, um, and and it's a it's a really nice thing, which make almost makes me think that one day the Anglo Australian Telescope, all sixty tons of it, should hang in the National Gallery as a yeah, a, why not as a work of art from Rosalie Gascoigne. Well, they they hang famous planes from various ceilings around the world. They so. do, yes, that's right, they do. Why, why not, not a famous telescope? <laughs> mm. So, did we answer Ryan's question about yes, why? It's, I think so, Ryan. I think, so the foam is is a safety feature. Uh, why, I think I know the answer to this, but just in case people are wondering, what causes the ice? I remember watching the Apollo launches and you'd see ice just 
yes, you know, falling off the rocket, the Saturn V <clears throat> rockets, uh, like nobody's business. Yeah. Big, big chunks of it. So, so it's the cryogenic fuels that are used. So the stuff in the tanks, uh, and uh, in that regard, the S- SLS, the, the you know Artemis rocket, is um, uh, a more difficult challenge than than the Saturn V. Saturn V's first stage used kerosene and liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen is a temperature of about minus 200 Celsius. Mm. Um, uh, but um, the SLS uses liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Liquid hydrogen is minus 253 Celsius. Uh, so uh, very cold. Uh, if you've got a moist climate, which you do in Florida, uh, you're going to get ice forming on it. So it is, it's a major issue. Yeah, all right. Uh, so it's it's all about safety, Ryan, and yeah. it's also a bit of a throwback to the the space shuttle missions, where they um, they obviously were very keen on on safety due to those couple of really sad incidents that did occur. But uh, thanks for your question, and we uh, we look forward to uh, the launch of Artemis One. Um, by the time this podcast gets out, uh, they will have done that fuel test. But uh, as of now, Fred and I don't know how that went. But the other problem is um, uh, to do with batteries on yeah. board the Artemis sure. One, which uh, uh, ran out of certification. So whether or not they get approval to stay on the launch pad and replace, well, they can't replace them on the launch pad. No, yeah, they right. need certification to actually al- allow those batteries to remain in in um, in flux, if you like. Uh, if they don't get that approval, the whole thing goes back to the assembly room. So. That will be a mess. And the, the batteries but, are uh, for the self-destruct system. It's quite interesting. Yeah. It's not, you know, powering up the spacecraft or anything. It's all about whether you can trigger something that will uh, basically destroy the, um, the the launch vehicle if it looks as though it's going off track in any way. Yes, indeed. All right. Good question, Ryan. Let's now head off to Cincinnati with a repeat offender named James. Hello, Mr. Dunkley and Professor Watson. James from Cincinnati, USA, with another question. Professor Pavel Krupa of the University of Bonn in Germany published an interesting article he says disproves the existence of dark matter. Essentially, he posits that lighter galaxies orbiting heavier ones should be slowed down by Chandrasekhar dynamical friction, and that observations actually show them speeding up as if they did not have dark matter. Professor Watson, Seeing as most astronomers believe dark matter is likely to exist, what do you say to Professor Krupa's claims? Thank you both, as always, for a wonderful podcast. I Thank think- you, James, for that astute question. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds complicated. Yeah, I think the I think um, I might have misheard there. The the uh, paper that um, James is referring to was about the non-existence of dark matter. Was that right? Rather than yes. definitive proof of the existence yes. of dark matter. Maybe I misheard that. Um, look, it, it's a hot topic. Uh, it's great stuff. We had a keynote lecture at the Macquarie University Astronomy Open Night uh, a week ago, last Saturday, uh, given by a Sydney University professor by the name of Celine Berm. Uh, and she basically played devil's advocate here she she put the pros and cons for uh dark matter or modified newtonian dynamics or something like that some sort of yeah. modification um <laughs> i should say uh, peter away and our, our big fan uh and an advocate of mond uh, was in the audience and very happy about the talk so that's good in fact i think celine's his supervisor for his phd but um the it 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 was it was a really interesting talk in that regard because uh you know you can present um uh fairly cogent arguments on both sides that dark matter is real that it's some sort of subatomic particle uh or that it's not that it's that we don't understand uh, either gravity or dynamics properly um and um i find the state we're in at the moment very interesting and mm. and pieces of you know evidence like the one that james has raised and i think we may have actually covered that or something very similar to it a few weeks ago we certainly talked about um the, the, the dynamics of of galaxies in in multiple systems and um, and what they tell us about um about dark matter um yeah. 
So that's a bit of evidence that suggests that it's not real. And yet there's plenty more that suggests that it is. And I think James is right. The astronomical community generally takes the view that dark matter is real. But I, I would say that uh, the, the doubt is, is growing, uh, that it is. Be, be, and that's largely because um, despite many, many experiments and uh, another upgrade, uh, the Large Hadron Collider has not revealed any sign of something that could be a dark matter particle. And the things that they're looking for are candidates like axions or neutralinos, which are theoretically proposed but have not had any evidence of. Um, mm. So uh, that's so we're in a, a period, I suppose you could liken it to um, uh, the time when the Higgs boson was predicted. I mean, it was predicted back in the 1960s by Peter Higgs, um, but it took until, uh, what was it, 2012 uh, before it was finally identified. And so you've got there a pretty significant period of time, getting on for 50 years, uh, when um, when something was thought to be true and alternative ideas were put forward as to why subatomic particles have mass, uh, which is what the Higgs particle does. It gives them all mass. So uh, maybe we're in a similar limbo situation to that. Um, it, there are one or two... Uh, scientists who are proposing a sort of killer experiment that you might be able to do. Um, um, and some of these might require a bit more time. Uh, so so it is possible that we might, uh, I mean, by a killer experiment, I mean one that definitively proves one way or the other. Uh, I suppose it's possible that we might see something like that, uh, you know, within the next few years. But uh, it's a very interesting situation. So, what would I say to that professor? Well, keep up the good work because we need, you know, we need the arguments that that uh, if we've got it wrong, we we want to know that. We've, yeah, we I, know I suppose it. it creates it. It brings up an interesting point, and that is um, making assumptions that dark matter absolutely exists focuses everyone on finding it. But if they're wrong then we're not looking in the right place or not looking, looking yeah. for the alternative. The, the, yeah, yes, that's right. And, and there, mm. is, there is another scenario, actually, uh, that maybe they're both right. Because um, <laughs> yes. the universe is a complicated and surprising place. Uh, you know, there might be places where dark matter is doing its thing and other places where there isn't any dark matter for whatever reason and yeah. modified dynamics is doing its thing. So, yes, it begs the question, uh, you know, will we ever understand it? And my guess is yes, we will. Uh, we've tied down, you know, it, it, it's a reminiscent, another, sorry, to keep drawing these things out of out of the air, but I remember a time when there were two totally different camps uh, in the determination of the Hubble constant, which is uh, that parameter that tells you how fast the universe is, is expanding. Mm. Uh, two um, values for the Hubble constant, which had very tight error bars, but one was twice as much as the other. Uh, one was 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec. The other was 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And guess what? The final answer that we now know is 75 kilometers yeah. per second, or thereabouts. It's almost Funny exactly that. the average of them. Yes. Um, so, yeah, you know, things like that uh, work out in astrophysics, and maybe the same will happen with dark matter. Now, I've got a feeling when they figure it out, they'll go, oh, of course. Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> Has that ever happened to you in your in your role as an astronomer? Uh Oh, look, every day, um, I, I honestly, when I look at uh, some of the, you know, my job now, a lot of it's just soaking in what's going on in the world of astronomy and looking mm. at what lots and lots of different groups internationally are doing. And there are times when I think exactly that. Why didn't I think of that? That's a yeah. brilliant experiment to do. I wish I'd thought of that. And, because some of these things are really quite simple and straightforward. Well, in, in radio, I, I still haven't got past the what's this button for situation. <laughs> still working on that one. Don't press it now. <laughs> don't touch anything. No, don't touch anything. If it ain't mm. broke, don't fix it. <laughs> exactly. All right. Uh, thanks, James. Great question. Great to hear from you. Hope all is well with the Cincinnati Bengals. I think they got off to a pretty slow start this season, but uh, still hoping for that Super Bowl. 
Fingers crossed. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Now, when you sign up for NordVPN, our sponsor, you don't just get the virtual private network, which is in this day and age essential to protect your personal um, virtual belongings, your bank accounts, uh, your personal documents, anything that's basically uh, valuable to some kind of hacker or crook or whoever. Uh, And we've seen some major breaches in some parts of the world in recent times where hackers have got hold of information and people have been exposed. Well, you can protect yourself by getting NordVPN and our sponsor has got a special deal going for Space Nuts listeners through a a particular uh, URL that I'll give you right now, nordvpn.com slash space nuts. What you get is the world's leading VPN service, Uh, You will also be able to sign up for a uh, a, a tool that will block malware, it'll block trackers and ads, and you can also protect your passwords and files, and you can get cloud storage all rolled up into one wonderful low price package through our sponsor NordVPN with a 30-day money-back guarantee. All you have to do is log on to nordvpn.com slash space nuts and click on the get the deal button. That's nordvpn.com slash space nuts and download uh, the best software in the business to protect you from cyber criminals. Now, back to the show. Roger, you're here also. Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Yes, indeed. And great to have your company and um, plenty of questions to get through still, Fred. And uh, this next one, uh, this might be a simple one to answer. This comes from Chris, who's been outside looking up. Hey there. My name is Chris from North Carolina, USA. It's kind of stargazing out here tonight. And it's upon a star of flickering white and red, which is seems to be abnormal from the rest of the stars we see in the sky tonight. Um, and looked up my phone, it seems to be Articus or Morphid in the Butis constellation. I'm not sure I'm saying that right. Um, but I was just wondering if that is an optical uh, illusion from possibly the atmosphere, or is that effects on the light from travel through space time on the way here? Uh, or is that just a property of the star? Um, but yeah, uh, again. First time leaving a question here. Um, you guys are amazing. Keep it up, guys. Uh, love your podcast. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. I think it's really cool that he was out observing, saw something, and thought of us. I reckon that was <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's awesome. That it is, is awesome. Yeah. Well, you came to the right place, Chris. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't get where um, where in the US Chris was. Yeah, you? I couldn't quite pick it up. Oh, never mind. But um, yeah. Anyway. It's great, and it's great to have um, you know so so many people from the United States coming in with questions. Mm. Um, so uh, Chris has sort of already answered his own question uh, because, uh, and it may well have been Arcturus, which is a bright star, which uh, could well have been fairly low on his horizon when he saw it. it I'm not sure when this question came in, but. Um, Flickering stars like that, uh, that flickering is entirely due to the atmosphere of the planet. Uh, because while st- stars do change in brightness, they don't do it over the timescales that we're talking about. And the stars flicker in a scene from the surface of the Earth on a timescale actually measured in um, thousandths of a second. Uh, so it's a, you know, it's a phenomenon which... Uh, the technical term there is a technical term we often call it twinkling and that's yes. the, you know that's the really nice way uh, but actually the technical term is scintillation uh, and it's uh, what's happening is that the light from the star which is constant hits the earth's atmosphere uh, which as as the light comes down through the atmosphere the atmosphere gets more and more dense um the atmosphere is not homogeneous. It's got warm and cold pockets of air in it. The temperature differences are not large, but they're enough to change the refractive index of the air, which means that they disturb the passage of the light. And in fact, um, when you get to looking at stars relatively low down on the horizon, not far above the horizon, you also get not just this 
uh, the, the the flickering, you also get the light being broken up into its spectrum colours because the the air currents are almost acting like prisms uh, that split the light up, and so you can see these flashes of red and green and uh, and blue sometimes. Uh, and it's actually something um, I find quite charming to watch, uh, but it's it's the death knell for ground-based astronomy yeah. because as soon as you get a big telescope looking at this, um, even high in the sky, the stars, you don't really notice the stars twinkling when they're you know a long way from the horizon with the naked eye, but the telescopes do. And what you see... Uh, 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 basically, the the st- first of all, the star image is waving around really quickly. It's it's sort of the image itself is is almost like um, you know a, a moth around a flame or something like that. It's just flickering around, uh, but it's also growing and tr- shrinking um, uh, as the atmosphere focuses and defocuses the light as these mm. air currents go through, and so. Um, it's a mess. It's like this sort of football uh, where it should be a stationary point of light. If you're in space, a tiny point of light, quite stationary. But basically, it looks like this inflated blob that's not only swelling and shrinking, it's moving around. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, one of the techniques astronomers use to combat this uh, called lucky imaging, where you you take it can only do it for bright objects. You take, essentially take a video, <clears throat> and in those moments where the atmosphere is briefly stable so you can see more detail, that's the image you select and you throw most of the rest away. Um, yeah. It's pioneered by uh, Craig Mackay, who's an old friend at uh, the University of Cambridge. So um, uh, that's the problem as, as seen by astronomers. There's one addition to it, uh, and that is when you get ob- uh, stars near the horizon and observe them in a big telescope, the atmosphere itself, the whole atmosphere, is acting like a giant prism. And so you get something called atmospheric dispersion, which means that instead of the star being a point of light, it's stretched into a short spectrum Uh. uh, with red at one end and blue at the other. And that's a distortion. And And if you add to that the scintillation that I was talking about, this twinkling effect then you can understand why you can see multiple colours when mm. when you're looking with the naked eye. So it's just simply a trick of the atmosphere. It is. And what which po- is a frustration. I, I've actually shared that frustration uh, when I've seen a fabulous moon rise and thought, oh, I've got to get a photo of that, and uh, it looks amazing to me. But then when I look at the photos, they're terrible because... The, the telescope is affected by the um, – because I'm looking out rather yeah. than up. Yeah. It, it's going through more atmosphere. and That's, it just that's exactly right. It's going through – Ruins the picture. Thicker part of the atmosphere. Um, yeah. One little postscript here, Andrew, mm. is that uh, generally um, – and this is – you know, some people perhaps think this is an old folk tale, but it's there's truth to it. Generally, planets don't twinkle. Um, uh, you, you really need to be looking at the – the bigger ones are bigger in terms of their angular diameter. Mercury does. Mercury is small enough that it, it behaves like a single point of light. Okay. Uh, and so you get the twinkling. But for Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, um, they have a, f- even though you can't see that they're a disk with the naked eye, that is the case. It is a disk. And so the light from the star follows slightly different paths through the atmosphere and mm. it sort of negates the twinkling so you get a much steadier appearance particularly with jupiter and jupiter's actually in our eastern sky right now i was now about to bring evening. that up it's yeah. it's closer than it's been in 59 years from yeah, what i yes, read yes that's right it's, uh, it's about at opposition and it's a it's a close opposition so yeah jupiter's uh one that it really it the atmosphere's got to work pretty hard to, to make Jupiter twinkle. It always has this steady light, as does Saturn as well, because that's reasonably big and bright mm-hmm. too. All right. I might have to dust off the uh, the telescope yeah. and see if I can get uh, a Jupiter pick. I reckon uh, it's worth a, worth a shot. Indeed so, it is. Uh, be interested to see if any of our listeners post anything on the Space Nuts podcast group on Facebook. Uh, thanks, Chris. Let's now uh, talk space time with Tom. Hey, guys, this is Tom in Orlando, Florida. On your most recent episode, you were talking about uh, 
space time. Somebody asked what it was made out of, and you mentioned the, the ether, the luminiferous ether. When I first heard of dark matter and dark energy, that's the first thing that popped into my mind was ether, that both of those are the same thing, that they're going to turn out not to exist. What do you guys think of that? Great show. Thanks. Wow. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't know the substance of that question, uh, but it certainly reflects on something we've already talked about It does, today. yeah. yeah. And, and it puts a nice historical perspective on it because, um, yeah, the ether, you know, was – it was it's a logical thing if sound waves need the atmosphere to travel through uh what is the medium that allows light waves to travel because uh, you know 19th century scientists knew that light was a wave motion mm. um and so the ether was was what was postulated it's an old idea actually that goes back um probably to ancient times but but the once you know that light is a wave motion then it's a natural thing to say okay it's a wave motion what's it a wave motion in um and the answer is nothing and it yeah. took that um classic michelson morley experiment uh in the 1880s to to determine that the ether wasn't there because um if there if there was an ether the speed of light should change uh, or should be different depending on what direction the Earth's moving in. Mm. Um, um, and it wasn't. It's always the same in a vacuum. And so that kind of put the nail in the coffin of the ether, uh, but also set the stage for both special and general relativity. Wow. Okay. Asked and answered, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a it's a good analog. And uh, Tom, well done. You know, it it uh, the, when you heard about those th those things, the the first thing you thought of was the ether and the fact that the ether was disproved. Well, as we've just been t talking about a few minutes ago, it could be the same with dark matter. And, mm. and dark energy is a slightly different one uh, because there is clearly something di driving the expansion of the universe uh, to accelerate. Uh, so there is definitely an energy there. Uh, but no, none of us have really any idea what it is, uh, what what this energy of space time is. Yes, yes, and uh, that's probably a tougher nut to crack than dark matter. It is and, actually. You're mm. absolutely right, Andrew. It is. I think it'll take us longer to work that one out than, than yeah. dark, uh, dark matter. I, I'm just um, curious, uh, going back to the flickering stars question and the, yes. that's been caused by the atmosphere, what must the ancients have thought when they looked up at the skies and saw the colours and the, and the flickering? And they probably would have seen more than we do because they wouldn't have had light pollution to deal with. So well, they, they, would did, have seen, yeah. they, they would have seen some amazing things and, and just stood there in wonder or maybe even fear. Yeah, perhaps. I think something like the flickering or twinkling would be they wouldn't have known it was the atmosphere, mm. um, but the fact that it sort of happens every night would have reassured them that it's just part and parcel of the whole, you know, the whole uh, mechanism of, of the heavens. Um, if it was something that suddenly hadn't happened before and suddenly did. Uh, That's then, different. Yeah, that would be different. But you're right, that, that it was the evening's entertainment for ancient people. Wasn't Possibly it? so, yeah. Yes, yeah. Fascinating. All right. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Chris. This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and being with a go. Space Nuts. All right, we've uh, got a few more questions to go and the next one comes from uh, our good old mate, Buddy in Oregon, I think. Yes, it is. It's Buddy. Hello, Space Nuts. Buddy here from Oregon again. Hey, do they think that could, could black holes absorb space itself? And if it does, could that be uh, dark matter? And then that could also be dark energy if space is expanding, pre expanding from itself. It's a place where the space is growing faster than the, the black hole is pulling it in. All right. Sorry, just a thought, guys. Uh, big fan. Thanks, buddy. It looks like all these questions are dovetailing very yeah, well. Very, very nicely, that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, black holes absorbing space itself. That's an interesting idea. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, and so I'm just trying to get my head around the best sort of analog for this. Um, because it, certainly black holes do very funny things to space. Mm. Um, uh, in, in our understanding, a uh, black hole is by definition a singularity, a, a point in space of infinite density. So it is actually in space. 
Uh, but the space around it is highly distorted, but not being sucked in. Um, it's the stuff that's moving through the space that's being sucked in. So I think I think we can um, be fairly reassured that, uh, that the ge- the geometry of space, while it is highly twisted and tortured in the region of a black hole, isn't being sucked into it. Right. If I can put it that way. Just yeah. the stuff that's in space that's being sucked in. But it is an interesting thought. Um, mm. Yeah, I wouldn't like to relate that one to dark energy. It's it's just too hard for my brain at this time. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so probably no, buddy. Yeah, probably I think no, no probably on that one. Mm. All right. Thanks, buddy. Now, Simon has texted us a question. Uh, he said, hi there, Space Nuts. Got uh, a question or two for you. How fast is gravity? Uh, it takes light about eight minutes to, to reach us from the sun, give or take. Um, but if the sun would just disappear, how would it? T- uh, how long would it take for Earth to lose the sun's gravity? Is it instantaneous? And how fast is magnetism when you're already answering the first question? So that's what he's asking. Have a good day. <laughs> you, you too, Simon. Um, I, I've never thought of gravity having speed. Uh, it does, and... Um, uh... We are, actually, I think we've um, spoken about it before. So, <laughs> okay. Well, I you, must have forgotten. You have thought about it before. Maybe it was so traumatic you've just wiped it from your brain. That, that'll do. That's a good. <laughs> yeah. That's a good reason. Um, so, yeah, it, um, you know, general relativity predicts that gravity uh, would propagate at the speed of light, and indeed it does, uh, uh-huh. because now we've got the wherewithal to measure gravitational. Uh, waves. Uh, we can time the s- speed of a gravitational event from one LIGO detector to the other. I can't remember how far apart they are. Three, four thousand kilometers, I think. I think it's mm. three thousand. Uh, and so, you know, it's a significant amount of time that it takes for the signal to get from one to the other. And it is indeed the speed of light. So uh, that relates, that would be the same for magnetism too, because light is an electromagnetic phenomenon. Uh, so magnetism is also part of that. So yes, everything goes at the speed of light, except space nuts. Yes, yes, we're a bit slow, <laughs> uh, especially me. Now he does also ask about the sun disappearing and how yeah. quickly the gravity would disappear. Yeah, from it, our it'd take eight, eight minutes before the, the Earth set off in a straight line, rather yeah. than being in orbit around the sun. So it would if keep, God just, just plucked the sun out of the sky, we'd have eight minutes before we all. Yeah, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't know destroyed. about that. We'd just see it going and the Earth would at the same time just carry on in a straight line. Yeah, um, and that would be the end of that. Well, it would be entertaining, wouldn't it? Be <laughs> quite a, For a brief time a until shot, we realised what was we, happening. Until we froze to death, yes. yes or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. And, all the, and all the oceans floated up out of the... Well, there's that too, yes. If we lost the Earth's gravity as well, yes. They are, uh, you know, if the Earth ceased to be a gravitation, gravitating object, we'd mm. be in deep trouble. <laughs> yeah. No, but if it was the, just the sun, we would just float off into um, a frozen hell. Oblivion, yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, great question, Simon. Thanks for that. Yeah, I've got to go to sleep tonight, you know. That's very difficult. Uh, no, appreciate the question. Always always creates – I love these what-if questions. We've, yeah, um, we've got a few coming up in the next several weeks, which I'm looking forward to as well. So, uh, yes, thank you, Simon. Now, one final question before we finish up for this episode from uh, – <laughs> I love this question simply because – he will not give up on this concept. <laughs> he will not let it go. He's tried, tw- tried twice to convince us that we could terraform Mars and we finally convinced him that it can't be done. So he's moving on. I'm talking about Martin. Yes. Oh, Space Nuts. Martin Berman Gorvine here, Ex- writer extraordinaire in many genres from Potomac, Maryland, USA calling to help fill up Andrew's inbox again after his email disaster. Okay, okay, so you guys have convinced me it's no use trying to terraform Mars. So what if we turn our tender attentions to the planet Venus? Let's say for the sake of argument that we could figure out a way to make the atmosphere tolerable and breathable. Um, And the bring the temperature down. 
uh, what kind of problems would Venus's extraordinarily slow rotation, its day, um, cause if um, the atmosphere were uh, were able to be uh, adjusted like that? Can't wait for the answer. <laughs> Love you guys. Love your podcast. Berman Gorvine, over and out. Thank you, Martin. Well, we already know it's a very dangerous place for lens caps. <laughs> so, <laughs> and spacecraft. That's, that's one important safety tip, yeah. and spacecraft, yes. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, so if if you had a benign atmosphere on Venus, and I, I suspect um, terraforming Venus is a non-starter uh, simply because it's too close to the sun. I might be wrong there because, um, you know, uh, in its history, the Earth has gone through some strange periods like the snowball earth period when the planet was covered in ice and that's due to the complexities of its atmosphere and maybe venus has complexities too that would let you get to a snowball venus despite where it is in relation to the sun but yes the the fact that um venus effectively venus is upside down that's the thing it's if you define the north pole as that point above which a planet seems to rotate anti-clockwise uh as on the Earth, then Venus is upside down and uh, has a slow rotation that's almost but not quite tidally locked to the to its orbital period. So mm-hmm. it would be a very strange world, um, you know, long, long, long days uh, and long, long nights. Um, uh, the Swedish would uh, adjust yeah, well to Venus. They'd, they'd be fine, yeah, yeah, especially the nights. Um, I mean, the Earth is destined for a similar uh, kind of fate when the Earth-Moon system finally stabilises. Unfortunately, I think the Sun will have turned into a red giant star before that. But when the Earth and Moon stabilise, the Earth, the Moon, the month and the day will be the same length because it will take the Moon the same time to go around the Earth as the Earth rotates. So one side of the Earth always faces the same side of the Moon. Yeah, or always faces the moon. So our day then will be about forty-seven of the present Earth days. Wow! Uh, and uh, the moon will be half a million kilometers away, so it will be a lot smaller in the sky. We won't have eclipses anymore, uh, but neither will one side of the Earth be able to see the moon anymore, and we'll get mm. these long days and long nights. And yes, the Swedes will love it. It will be great. Be yeah. Great. Well, anybody up in that uh, northern hemisphere <laughs> type of area. Where they get those long summers and long, yeah, terribly long nights in winters. The, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's still one of my uh, bucket list things is to go and play golf in um, Scandinavia at one o'clock in the morning, or tee off at midnight. Yeah, which they do. They do. I'm yeah. told. Oh, they would easily. I'd love definitely. to give it a try in the, in the Arctic regions. That's right. Yeah. That'd be um, fun. It's charming, as you know. We've been many times up to northern Sweden in winter, when mm. the sun doesn't rise. Uh, and in yes. fact, on a number of occasions, we've celebrated the first sunrise of the year. Actually, the last time I think was in Norway, in Narvik, uh, big pun, Tromsø, where the sun just appeared over the horizon. Um, yeah, coming back into it, reality. Isn't there a time of year where it kind of bobs? Well, it, it's what well, it bobs in the sense that. Um, you know the, the, if you've got a the horizon, terrain yeah the horizon makes it appear and disappear as it drifts yeah. along <laughs> that's what i meant i didn't mean it actually bobbed like a ping pong ball. no i know i, know, I know. knew that yeah <laughs> just my interpretation of the situation but uh yeah it's um venus is fascinating because its um composition is um, it, it's it's similar size to earth so when we it are is. standing on venus it's almost almost the same gravity is it not its mass is a bit different i think the density is different i can't remember which okay. way it goes so, but but you're right it's more or less the same uh and um we don't actually know uh, I, i've read papers recently that suggest that venus may have plate tectonics mm. because um the, the jury's kind of been out on that for a while. It, there are certain uh, geological features. Of course, you can only see them through radar yes. uh, because the clouds are pretty well opaque, so you can't see any details with a visible light telescope. But um, the, there are suggestions that there are some geological features on Venus that look as though there's been recent activity 
that could be interpreted as as tectonic movement, a bit like we have mm. on Earth. So yeah, so fascinating. Um, great Martin, place. You to know, go. Martin, when it comes to terraforming, never say never. No, never say never. I just I look forward to reading whatever science fiction book it is that Martin's writing that's got oh, actually, a what, Venus in While it. I'm thinking about it, hang on. Yep. Uh, Martin sent me a book and I meant to say thank you. Martin, and I think I might have mentioned it in a previous um episode, but uh the yeah, I'm looking f- I haven't I'm going I'm taking Whoa. a plane trip soon and I'm gonna take that and read it on the plane. Uh oh, The is. Double Life by Martin Berman Gorvine. Fabio, so, um, yeah, thank you for great. that. Um, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, so, yeah, that'll be fun. So, thanks, Martin, for sending that in. I appreciate it. And thanks for the question. As always, entertaining. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for your um, your 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 sequel, Venus <laughs> um, terraforming question. I'm sure there will be one. And then it'll work on something. It'd yeah. be Mercury next. No, well, I was going to say, let's do the song. You know, why, why bother? Yeah, why about, not? You know, yeah, why not? <laughs> why mess about with planets? Yeah, Indeed. Uh, thank you, Martin, and everybody who contributed. And to those who've already sent questions in that you haven't heard yet, we'll get to them unless we've already answered them in some other form, although sometimes we double up just because the topics are so very fascinating and um, so insightful too. We, we love to hear your questions. So you can send them in to us via our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. Uh, you can click on the uh, AMA link and send us a text question or an audio question there, or you can click on the tab on the right-hand side of the homepage which basically allows you to record an audio question. As long as you've got a device with a microphone, you are set. And uh, don't forget to leave your reviews through your favourite podcasting platform. Uh, always helpful. Uh, just sort of gets um, gets us noticed by people who probably would enjoy Space Nuts but didn't know we exist. So uh, <laughs> reviews are always very, very handy and uh, and they work. I mean, we've, we've got uh, a growing audience, which is fantastic. And thanks for all the positive feedback too. We really appreciate it. Uh, glad you're enjoying the show. And um, while you're on the, the website, while I'm spruiking, uh, don't forget to visit the Space Nuts shop and uh, the Astronomy Daily tab there. And don't forget our other podcast, Astronomy Daily, which is available through our website as well. Uh, there's over 20 editions of Astronomy Daily out there already. So um, listen in to that. Um, I think that just about brings us to the conclusion. Fred, thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's great to have everybody's questions. Long may they continue. It's Good to get my brain turning over again on some of these issues. Uh, so let's do it again sometime soon. Uh, that will be great. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Fred. Fred Watson, uh, astronomer at large, joining us every week here on Space Nuts. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for listening. Looking forward to your company in the next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. <laughs>